After a boat journey from solitude gone wrong, we find ourselves stranded on a deserted island somewhere off the coast of Skyrim. With all of my crew dead, and no skills or survival experience, it's safe to say I'm in trouble. It's now a race against time, as with survival mode on, I'll need to find food and shelter to have any chance of staying alive, all while avoiding the many dangers I could encounter on this mysterious island. With a completely abandoned island, and not a person or merchant in sight, I'll need to learn the ways of survival quickly. How do I get armour and weapons to protect me from danger? What animals are native that I can hunt for food? Where do I get some well needed rest at night? And most importantly, is there any way off the island so I can get back home to Skyrim before my wife replaces me? And so, the adventure begins on day one with Alan Allenson facing a very harsh new reality. He begins by getting his crewmate out of the water and searching for anything useful finding an old dagger, as well as some clothes to keep him a bit warmer. Followed by scouring the barrels on shore for any remaining food, and getting lucky with some of the sunken cargo holding a few apples and salt. With limited goods, it's time to head inland, and the path takes me through an eerie cave, filled with strange types of mushrooms which I collect as I pass through. Also encountering a skeever, which I kill and then harvest its pelt and meat. Without prior hunting skill, it was some much needed practice. After emerging on the other side of the cave, the mystery of the island deepens. I've made it down to the dock, and there's a lot to explore. Where my ruin up there, some sort of watchtower up there, got an old abandoned house, and by the looks of it, another ship, so we might have survivors on the island. The ruined house doesn't have much, but at least it's a solid roof, and with a fireplace that can be repaired, it'll be a good place to shelter. We also find some linen wraps and pieces of charcoal, which we stash in case they prove useful. And, after a long and stressful day, choose to get some sleep in the abandoned house to prepare for tomorrow. Day 2, and still looking for anything that can help me survive, I explore the sunken ship in the harbour. First, finding a lockbox containing documents about the crew, which might lead us to survivors, before coming close to death via drowning and being forced to surface. Being more careful, we head back down and find a crate of supplies, before finding a crew member who didn't make it taking any valuables, and on the third journey down, find another soul who didn't make it off the ship, taking some food and drink, which buys us time. After getting back to shore, we read the journals and discover the ship is investigating this to Emma Island, and there's potentially a few other survivors scattered around. Hopefully, we can find someone to help us. Soon enough, night falls and we take refuge in a nearby watchtower, which luckily has a bedroll to provide some comfort, and with a look into the distance, reality sinks in. There's not another piece of land for miles around. At least the night sky offers some sort of relief from the constant fear. Day 3, and with daybreak we can explore last night's tower, finding some firewood for a campfire, as well as a pickaxe, which could help me craft some armour. Another tower on the way back to the docks seems a lot larger, and after climbing the stairs, we figure it's probably a lighthouse. With enough logs, we might be able to light it and signal for help. With our scavenged food running low, we spend some time fighting the local mud crab population and gathering any food and items we can from their bodies. I scavenge some branches and stone to make a primitive axe, which will help with collecting wood for fires, and after collecting dead wood, we have enough for a basic campfire. I also discover a stone carving which tells me I'm off the coast of Skyrim and with some paper I found at the dock, and a piece of charcoal, take a copy of the map that's etched into it. Now I know where I am, I just need to find a way off this rock. After a long day, set up a campfire in the tower to prepare for another rough night's sleep, and the fire is the only thing helping me avoid the horrendous rain and thunder of this cursed island. But there's one type of thunder you don't want to avoid, and that's today's sponsor, War Thunder. War Thunder is the most extensive vehicle combat game ever made, and it's now available for free on PC and consoles. You can command over 2,500 tanks, planes, helicopters and ships from 10 major nations, ranging from biplanes and armoured cars from the 1920s to the fighter jets and tanks from the modern day. As a history buff, I love jumping into battles in World War II vehicles, taking on massive warships and getting into dogfights in the skies for my trusty plane. And even better, War Thunder has a massive customization system with countless camouflages, markings and decorations for every type of vehicle so you can really make it your own. I always get immersed in the intense combat of War Thunder, where incredibly detailed vehicles, realistic graphics and authentic sound effects place you right at the helm of the most powerful war machines of our time in massive scale battles. Join a worldwide community of over 70 million players in epic PvP battles today and get stuck into the amazing experience that is War Thunder. 
With a massive vault of high quality content to discover, I've not found a better game for fans of military history. With War Thunder being free on PC, Xbox and PlayStation, now is the perfect time to jump into battle. And if you sign up using my link in the description or pinned comment, you'll get a massive bonus pack to give you a head start if you're a new player or haven't played for the last six months. But this bonus is only available for a limited time, so make sure to take advantage and claim it now. Day four, and after an early breakfast, my rations are dangerously low. So hunt and kill a couple of skeevers, which will help for a day. But I'm in desperate need of a more reliable food source. Heading into the final unexplored tower of this area, I find an empty room with a locked door. Breaking into this locked door had some very unexpected surprises. Okay. Is this Blackreach? No one here. Okay, nothing's trying to kill me yet. Uh, what the hell? That's not a dragon, is it? Surely not. Oh my god. That's a dragon. That's a dragon. Uh, I mean no harm. Oh my god, I'm stuck. What the hell? Why is a dragon down here? Ignore, like, no, let's just go. Let's just go. Never return here again. After the discovery of a dragon on the island, it's time to move inland and hope it doesn't follow me. So, I follow the path, encountering some elk and deer on the journey. But, we'll need to craft a bow to have any chance of hunting them. Continuing on the path, our first real test appears with a wolf attack. And I get lucky, managing to kill it with some minor wounds, taking a tide and any meat we might be able to cook. In the area is a wild potato plant which could be used to grow some more crops, as well as an abandoned shack. Outside is a woodcutting block, and luckily an old axe I can make use of for firewood. But I use all of my luck, as the inside isn't somewhere that's livable long term. But it'll do for a night. Day 5, and it's an early start to find more suitable shelter. Walking through the foggy woods, listening out for any sign of danger. The wolf attacks start again after catching my scent. The island is increasing in danger. Luckily, we find wild leeks, which will help me stay alive if I can find somewhere safe to grow more. Not only is the island home to wolves, but wild bears also roam. We narrowly avoid one blocking the path with it busy eating two of its kills. After hours on the forest path, there's another Dwemer house in the distance. Third time lucky is all I can hope for. Hey, I've got an old hunter's cabin. I could set up shop here. Charcoal. I've got a fireplace. Storage. Comfortable looking bed. And some hunter boots. Okay. I can work with this. Outside. A planter. Workbench. And a forge. This old forge could be fired up with 15 pieces of charcoal. Okay. We're not far off that, I don't think. Garden. If you had a shovel, you could rework the soil and start planting things. Okay. Well, we've got a job to do. Let's get this set up. With a safe area to set up base, we make some improvements. Starting with building a tanning rack and installing it inside for some crafting options. With leather strips crafted from animal hides, we craft a basic bow to start hunting with, as well as basic stone arrows. Exploring, we find an old woodcutting stump which is too rotted to use, but we can search for a replacement. And finally, set up campfire to keep warm for the night, before heading to bed for some much needed rest. Day 6, and luckily we find an old shovel tucked in a corner of the house. Hopefully we can grow crops, but that'll have to wait as food has run out. It's time to put the bow to the test. Heading back to the forest, I encounter a deer which gets cornered for an easy kill, providing some venison and hide which won't go to waste. And I also take down a fox who stumbled in my direction, but I'm immediately hit with guilt after another fox heads over to mourn its passing. But I'm hungry, and this fox has made the same mistake as its friend. I do pause to thank them for their offering to my continued survival though. After a successful hunt, I head back to work the soil in the farm area, digging a few holes for vegetables, planting the four potatoes I've managed to gather through my exploration in the forest, and in the second plot of land, plant the wild leeks I've gathered. In a few days, there might be some crops to harvest. I gather some dead wood from a tree, light up the campfire, 
and cook the meals I've gathered from today with some barely edible skeever and a more pleasant venison. Sadly, Fox doesn't seem to be very edible. Day 7, and the hunting gives us enough experience to get some extra damage from our bow, which could help survival a lot. But, so will armour, so I craft some hide laces, which when combined with the fur gathered from yesterday's hunt, can be turned into some basic fur armour. I also spend some time crafting a linen travel cloak to help keep me warm, with scavenged boots, some protection and warmth from the armour, and equipped with the bow, we might just survive on this island. Day 8, and after a day at the base crafting, it's about time we get out and explore again. This time taking a cliffside path, which leads to the shore, and a very welcome surprise. Hold on, is that a ship? Oh my god, can I go off the island? It looks... drivable. No mimo crabs. Old ship discovered. Further investigation shows us damage that needs to be repaired, with us needing mammoth pelt and some furs to fix the sail, and some of the wooden boards are damaged and need replacing. At least there's a glimmer of hope, despite all of the work that needs to be done. Day 9, and it's back to exploring to find the parts we need to repair the ship. During the usual early morning hunt, I start tracking a deer, only to find a tree trunk which would make a perfect woodcutting block. So break it down and transport it back to the shelter, which gives me a perfect place for firewood chopping. Continuing to explore, we find an old dwarven centurion collapsed in a river. Who knows how long this has been here? Maybe a fellow survivor had bested it. Day 10 starts with taking stock of materials I need so it's fresh in my mind and I'm always working towards a goal. Followed by a day of chopping wood. Not only will I always have wood available for my campfire, but there'll be plenty which can be turned into charcoal to start up the forge for crafting. Once the wood is chopped and stored in the house, I use a few pieces of firewood to get the charcoal ready for tomorrow. Day 11 and it's time to repair the forge, using all of the charcoal to reignite it and the smelter to bring them back to their former glory. The first job is to craft a cooking pot but we need steel ingots, and I don't have any iron or corundamore to make them. So, I take my pickaxe and head out on a scouting expedition to try and find some ore veins. The search takes me all the way through the hunting forest to the area we first discovered after being shipwrecked. Nestled to the left of the cave we exited is a corundamore vein that we quickly mine for the ore. And from the top of our old tower shelter, I notice something glistening in the distance, which luckily was a large vein of iron ore. And once mined, we have everything needed for our steel ingots. Day 12 arrives, and after a long day exploring and mining, it's time to recover. Spending the morning crafting the steel ingots, and then the cooking pot, installing the new pot inside our shelter, which opens a lot of cooking options, and helps keep the bitter cold out during the night. Luckily, our crops have grown over the last couple of days, so the potatoes and leeks are harvested, and then replanted in the gardens to increase the yield we can harvest. This soil must be very fertile to make them grow this fast. Day 13, and we're back to exploring a plain full of glowing mushrooms close to home, which also happens to be home to the mammoths we'll need to repair the ship. The only problem is, there's no way my bow will take one down, so we need a solution to help level the playing field. But mammoths aren't the only thing that occupy this plain. A working centurion with enough power to take down a mammoth roams the area. Trying to get close for an opportunity to take the pelt proves too dangerous, so I retreat before it notices and follows me home. Not wanting to leave empty handed, we spend some time fishing in the nearby lake for salmon. It'll make a nice addition to the current diet. Day 14, and continuing to explore the new area, I spot a beautiful waterfall and some ancient structures, so head in that direction to investigate. The first tower is the resting place of a crew member from the ship in the dock area, who has a few useful items we can use. But his journal has an interesting note. A plant called Mammoth's Bane grows near the Mammoth Plain, and combined with cave mushrooms, makes a potent poison. And thankfully, his mortar and pestle is still usable, now just to find the right ingredients to make this poison. The man's iron sword and hide shield also make good upgrades to the current weaponry. Day 15 starts after an uncomfortable stay in the tower overnight, but there's more exploring to be done. Heading further into the Dwemer ruins reveals a few buildings to explore. The first appears to be an old centurion factory with an unfinished centurion, spare parts, and old Dwemer schematics. The second door is an alternate entrance to the Blackreach style area, where a dwarven spider worker attacks and manages to do some serious damage before we manage to best it. But it seems another crew member wasn't so lucky, 
and that's one less name from the list who might have survived. Surveying the area also shows me that Falmer occupy this cave. With a dragon and now Falmer, this is somewhere I need to avoid at all costs. Day 16 rolls around after searching this ruined area through the night, but it's time to head home and get some rest. On the way down the mountain, we discover a cave entrance and decide to investigate. Inside is a beautiful shaft of sunlight beaming in, which seems to make this cave ideal for interesting plants and mushrooms to grow. Surely one of these, or the beach cave mushrooms we found, are the ones needed for the mammoth poison. With them all picked, the rest of the day is spent journeying home, resting and healing after a hard couple of days exploring, mixed with a couple of tough battles. Day 17 and we return to the plains to find the mammoth bane mentioned in the journal, soon spotting the plant that was shown in the book's diagram. So we collect as much as we can find, who knows how many hits a mammoth will take to bring it down. With a satchel full of flowers, we head back home and start testing the ingredients, mixing any mushrooms we've found with the mammoth's bane. After a lot of failures, we get the right mix after using a maize cap mushroom, and now we're a step closer to home. Day 18, and with a few days of exploring, our food stores are empty, so it's time for a hunting trip after a quick look at a fantastic sunrise. On the way to the hunt, I find some wheat, maybe dropped by a creature, but I can use it to grow more, and then spend time hunting the local deer and harvesting any hides or venison I can find. This hunt takes me high up into the mountains, which are completely unexplored, and after deciding to stick around, there's plenty of new landmarks to explore. Over the edge of a cliff is another shipwreck, and another chance of survivors if I can find my way down the jagged cliffs, and with many cave entrances in the area, there's bound to be something interesting hidden within them. With my interest peaked, we spend the night on the cliff edge by the fire, overlooking the vast body of blue water that's keeping us here. Day 19 begins with a leap of faith into a nearby cave. Probably stupid, but there's not much to lose. Luckily, we landed some water and can explore this massive cave. Where the hell have I landed? I've just come from in there, landed in the water, and I'm lost. Survivors? Pirates? What the hell? It doesn't have to be like this. Ah! Headshot. Okay. Who are these people? Pirates. After looting the area of some treasures and a weapon upgrade, we read the journal found on the Orc. And sadly, these pirates belong to the ship we spotted yesterday. But there might still be some treasure on board to help us escape the island. And luckily, the pirate's rowboat still works. So we travel back to the dock on the other side of the island to store it. Day 20, and after staying overnight in the dock area, we decide to light the brazier we'd found a couple of weeks ago. With so many shipwrecks, we know there's travel around the area, and maybe we get lucky with a passing ship. But, nothing seems to sail through, despite an entire day spent watching and waiting, until the darkness of night reduces our ability to spot anything in the distance. We know now we can't waste time waiting. We're on our own. Day 21, and after setting off back home, we stumble on another ruin hidden inside a rock formation, so head inside. This structure is a maze of corridors that carry on for miles, with nothing of any use to be found but a familiar sight is found at the end of the passageway. Inside, we come face to face with a Falmer who seems hesitant to attack, so we take the initiative and fire a few arrows to drive it back. Although it doesn't attack, it's still a tough creature and takes many arrows to bring down. But the risk pays off with a Falmer shield being found as a huge armor upgrade. Feeling brave, we take in the amazing view before heading deeper into the ruin but this turned out to be a mistake as the Falmer had gathered further in. We narrowly avoid an arrow that could have killed us, before frantically trying to spot the archer, and after a few more near misses, it's time to leave. This place gets more dangerous every time we enter. Day 22 is a much needed rest after some serious near misses, so we spend some time planting the wheat found the other day, and collecting the vegetable harvest that has been grown nicely. With plenty of potatoes and leek, we can afford to eat them. So, with the most recent harvest of leek, we'll grill them up, and with grilled leek on the menu, we have a steady and consistent food source if our hunting fails. Day 23, and itching for more adventure, we head to the site of the pirate shipwreck, making our way down the sheer rock face and finding a dead end with one way down. So we take the plunge and jump off the cliff into the ocean and swim aboard the ship. Searching through the ship, and breathing in the small pockets of the unflooded boat, we find some more wheat in a barrel, but there's nothing else of note, 
apart from the unfortunate sailors who didn't make it out of the ship in time. Day 24, and after spending the night sleeping on the ship's deck, it's time to scale back up the cliff, and after a long journey, spot another watchtower in the distance. But night is rolling in again, so we need some shelter, and there just so happens to be a cave. Unfortunately, this cave already has an occupant, a huge cave troll, but I'm desperate, so let's take it down. My arrows have next to no effect, and with a basic knowledge of magic, my fire spell doesn't do enough damage quickly enough to bring the creature down. It soon gets tired of me annoying it, so chases me out of the cave, and follows me outside. Outmatched, I have no choice but to risk everything, running towards a mammoth for help, and the gods must have been watching as they fight for me and kill the troll. Not wanting to annoy the mammoth, I head back inside the cave and explore, but there's nothing but a locked chest I can't open, so I set up a fire to try and wait out the night with some comfort. Day 25 begins with a hike to the tower spotted in the previous day, in miserable conditions. Inside we find some dwarven arrows, linen wraps for the sail, and a huge upgrade with a dwarven bow. Now hunting should be a lot more efficient. At the top of the watchtower, we find a rare gem, and another map similar to the map we had made weeks ago. Someone else had tried and failed to escape this island if the map was left unattended. Sheltering from the storm, we notice a path leading off into the mountains, which might have something to help us repair the ship. Day 26, and after sleeping in the tower, we have enough experience to increase our bow's damage, and head home once the weather is cleared up. We plant the wheat that was found from the shipwreck for more food options, and with the linen from the tower, we have enough for the sail repairs, but we're still missing leather strips. Inspired with the thought of another checkpoint and escape, we craft the leather from the animal pelts, and store it for later. Day 27, and with a couple of boat repair tasks complete, it's time to finally kill a mammoth, so we head to the plains for this challenge. They poisoned. And it do anything though. Okay. We do a lot of damage. Poison again. I'm sorry, Mammoth. You have to die. The poison is very effective, and after thanking the gods for allowing me to kill this mammoth, it's time to retrieve the pelt. Now the sail can be repaired, but we're no closer to fixing the planks. Day 28, and with the planks in mind, we head off to the mountain path with the hope that there's something to help us craft them. Walking most of the day through the hilly terrain, we pass a lot of wildlife, spot another huge Dwemer ruin in the mountainside, before making our way to a clearing with a welcome sight. What looks to be a sawmill that is still operational could be the key to making planks, and it's confirmed when we find that it's somehow in perfect working order. Hoping a survivor is in the area, we spot a house in the distance and excitement takes over, but something feels odd with infected looking wildlife roaming. Sadly, the house seems to be empty with no signs of any life, but it'll work as a temporary shelter while we figure out how to craft these planks. Day 29 and it's time to get to work. So we chop down a huge tree and drag it into the sawmill. Cutting it into boards, we realise that one tree provides five wooden planks. We just need 15 more. So before sunset, manage to get another tree chopped down and converted into the planks. Hopefully one more day before heading back to base. And that can't come quick enough as our creatures gather in the field behind the sawmill at night. Maybe this is why this house was abandoned. Day 30, and after standing guard all night, we're exhausted and head to the nearby ruins in the hope of finding somewhere to rest. On the ascent, we find another shipwreck survivor, and probably the person who kept the sawmill running, but looks like a Falmer fight caused his demise. The path continues to a mountaintop garden, which leads further up the mountain under a huge waterfall eventually reaching more structures and a malfunctioning centurion who seems to have no awareness of its surroundings. Inside the structure is strange with a deep hole leading to certain death and strange Dwemer technology that we can't seem to operate. Pushing further into the ruin leads to a door which is nothing more than an overlook of the valley below. Exhausted and terrified, we head out of the ruin and make the long journey back to our home base for some rest barely making it through the journey, and just stumbling far enough to be safe. Day 31, and we're low on food, so harvest as much as we can, making sure to replant wheat to increase our harvest, and with some newly picked leeks, make sure to grill up some more for the upcoming trip back to the sawmill, followed by a hunting trip which bags us a couple of deer and some much needed venison. The last few days have been very hungry work. And on day 32, 
We quickly make our way to the sawmill to get the last 10 planks, chopping down trees and converting them into planks of the sawmill. With one more night avoiding the creatures, this should be the last we see of this cursed place. Day 33, and with a lot of material ready to be transported across the island, we need some help. And luckily, there's a working cart that we should be able to pull. After loading up the materials, we head off on the long walk home, avoiding grazing mammoth herds, passing over steep mountains and rough terrain, before seeing the familiar glowing mushrooms of our home valley, and finally we're back and somehow alive. Day 34 is another unglamorous day, with us transporting the materials needed to fix the ship all the way down to the wreckage, in preparation of some serious repair work needed to get this ship seaworthy. And days 35 to 37 are spent doing just that, repairing the ship with the materials, and we're one step closer to home. But we still need supplies for the journey if we want to have any hope of survival. Day 38 and needing venison, potatoes and a map, we get to work. Luckily, we have plenty of potatoes growing, and we crafted our map weeks ago. So now, we just need the venison for our journey. But the deer prove elusive, taking us most of the day until finally one crosses the woodland path, and we get the kill, taking its meat and heading back home. We cook the remainder of our food, and head to bed for hopefully our last day on the island. Day 39 begins with a reminiscent look over our home for the last few weeks, and an excited journey down to the ship. We store our supplies below deck and prepare for the journey, taking one last look at the island, and hoping we never have to step foot on it again. But sad we couldn't help any of the lost souls trapped here before me. And finally, we set sail for home. And on day 40, we safely arrive back at the solitude docks we'd left all those weeks ago, happy to see the towering skyline of the city. The mystery of the island may have gone unsolved, and we couldn't help any of the poor souls trapped there before me, but at least we fought off death itself in a real challenge for survival. Now, the only thought on the long walk home is, has my wife replaced me and changed the locks to my house? Let's hope not. Thanks again to War Thunder for sponsoring this video, and don't forget it's available on PC, Xbox and PlayStation for free. So use my link in the description or pinned comment to take advantage of the amazing bonus pack, which will give you everything you need to jump right into the battlefield, including premium vehicles, in-game currency, and a great vehicle skin to show off with.